really happy to be here. It turns out I'm here all the time. My apartment's like, you know, two blocks off of campus, and I'm rollerblading and biking on campus a lot on the weekends. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here to chat with all of you today and talk a little bit about uh, the innovation that we do at Google and how, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit is built there, both on a large macro level, company-wide, as well as on a small project level. Um, and I guess, you know, they, they asked me to lay out a little bit about my background, and then I thought I would spend some time going through what I've learned about innovation while I've been at Google. So, as you probably can read, I actually was here as both a bachelor's and a master's student. I did symbolic systems uh, because I thought it was something interesting that I could only do here at Stanford. And then when I was done with that, I decided that I really wanted to be able to market myself as a software engineer. And I didn't really feel because I had never written a compiler and I hadn't written an OS that I could. So I continued on and did a master's in computer science and joined Google pretty much right after that, at the height of the dot-com bubble uh, in 1999. So more than happy to talk about you know, decisions and, and how I, I made, decided, ultimately decided to, to choose Google. So I think it was an interesting process. Um, but I thought I'd spend the majority of, the, at least the, the speaking time I would do today, talking to you about some sort of slogans, philosophies, or theorems of innovation that we've discovered at Google and then you know, leave an ample amount of time for questions. So the talk I wanted to give was about ideas about innovation. And it's basically a top nine list. It probably should be a top 10, but maybe top nine is actually more innovative around the things that we've learned at Google. <laughs> um, and uh, they're not in any particular order, but I'll just throw them out there and then give you some illustrative examples of what it means and how ultimately how it works. So one is that ideas come from everywhere. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, how do you get the idea for Google Maps or the Google Toolbar? Where did it come from? And the answer is, in an environment like Google, ever since the company was small, even till now when it's really large, we expect everyone to have ideas. You know, our engineers come up with ideas. Some things come top down. Some ideas come from our users. And it's interesting because when you look at the myriad of different products Google's released, we actually have examples of almost all of the above. Google Maps, you know, the idea for that actually came from an acquisition. We found these four engineers in Australia who were just amazingly good at building mapping interfaces and combined them with a bunch of JavaScript experts uh, at Google and said, okay, let's take their ideas around how you navigate maps, place them on the web using JavaScript, and ultimately build this really great application. So, you know, ideas really do come from all kinds of different inspirations. So there's other things that we do that are very strategic and top-down. When we looked at, say, something like Google Desktop, we thought, you know, for a lot of strategic reasons, we need to have a deeper, more meaningful relationship with our users. What functionality could we provide them that they'll want to have on their computer and that will allow them to access Google really easily all the time? So sometimes it comes from an overall strategy or a strategic concern. Sometimes it comes from you know, an acquisition that we're doing. And sometimes it just comes from someone wanting to solve a problem that they feel we could solve better. Google News is a great example of that. There was an engineer named Krishna Bharat, and he was a news junkie. And after September 11th, he found himself really consumed with reading news. And he found he had the same pattern every day. He would go and visit his favorite 15 news sites, and he would try and find you know, the same story about anthrax all throughout you know, the different stories to get all the different perspectives and get the maximum amount of information. And then after he did this for about a month, he thought, well, this is kind of silly because you know, he's like, I work at a search engine, and I actually could probably crawl all this data. And I could also, you know, he's actually an expert in artificial intelligence. So he thought, you know, I could cluster things. So he built this little script that crawled his favorite 15 news sites, gathered up all the news, and then clustered it. So it would actually group the stories he wanted to read together. And he built this little tool for himself to read news more efficiently, used it for a while, thought it was pretty useful, mailed it out to the company and said, hey, like, I use this to read my news. Maybe some of you would find it useful. And, you know, a bunch of us saw that and me and said, you know, this isn't just an internal tool to help Krishna read news better. This is something that could help a lot of people read news better. And we should you know, take it up to the next level so it's not just a plain white page with lots of blue links, but actually looks more like a news experience and, and make it available to our users. So there's a myriad of different places that ideas come from. And what you really want to do is set up a system where people can feel like they can contribute to those ideas and that the best ideas rise to the top in sort of a Darwinistic way, by proof of concept, a powerful prototype, by demonstrating that it's going to fill a really important user need, so on and so forth. The next slogan I have is share everything you can. Uh, and I think that one thing that's been really fundamental about Google is we have an incredibly open culture. 
Uh, until we went public, in fact, until about three months before, our VP of sales got up every day and told us the revenue numbers for the company. And it's amazing when you take a lot of smart, motivated people and give them access to a huge amount of information, how well informed their choices are about what they want to work on and what needs to be done. And I think that's, that's been you know, really amazing because it's helped us manage the organization in a way that's really flat. So you, know, you may have heard things like, you know, GE has a 1 to 12 rule, which means for every 12 employees, there's one manager. You know, we've had a very flat organization. So we have situations where we'll have 40 or 60 employees with one manager. And the idea there is we want people, if they can prioritize their own time and manage themselves really well because they have access to a really broad array of information, that works well. And it gives them the empowerment and feeling of independence that they need to be really successful. And share everything you can also applies to another philosophy that I think is rather interesting, which you know, it really struck me from a book that was written by Tom Kelly called The Art of Innovation. And he has a concept there around taking credit. And he'll say that you know, one thing that happens sometimes is that when people come up with an idea, they'll think that they have a really good idea. And they throw it out there to the organization, and then they follow it around, because they want to make sure that everyone knows it's their idea. right? And, you know, and he said that you know, there'll be people who can become so consumed with, you know, does everyone know this is my idea? that they ultimately stop producing new ideas. Mm -hmm. And he said that you know, he made this observation that at IDEO, he saw this phenomenon where people who just put all their energy into coming up with the most ideas possible and not really worrying about where those ideas flowed inside the organization or how they got used or whether or not they got credit, ultimately ended up flourishing more because they became known as such fountains of ideas that you know, someone would say, well, where did this idea come from? And they'd say, well, I don't know. You know maybe it was Joe. Joe always has ideas. <laughs> it was this very interesting concept of not being territorial to the point of, of actually hindering yourself. And I think it was a really interesting observation. It's something that we do a pretty good job practicing Google, which is not to say that people don't get credit for the ideas that they come up with, but I think that people are focused more on the users and on innovation and less on how they themselves, you know, are fulfilled, and as a result, they actually have a more fulfilling experience and, and you know, are noted for their achievements more. The next philosophy uh, came off of a flyer I saw here that just really struck me. It was actually in one of the dot coms had a flyer up in the basement of Gates that said, we're bril you're brilliant, we're hiring. Um, and it's actually, this slogan works actually really well as a job ad. In fact, in the early days of Google, they had this, we were, when we were trying to hire people, our v VP of engineering, um, throughout this uh, opportunity where we could all run an ad and he had a competition for who could come up with the best hiring ad. And I just ripped off this slogan and put it on the top of the result page. I think it's really funny because people, it had the highest click-through rate of all the ads we put up there, like a factor of five. People just see it and they're like, I'm brilliant, click. <laughs> and so <laughs> it turns out like, you know, flattery really does get you everywhere. So, um, but you know, the, the point that I wanted to point out here is that it's really wonderful to work in an environment with a lot of smart people. Um, one, because I think it challenges you to think and work on a different level. Uh, and the analogy I use for my own life here is that I had a piano teacher when I was in high school, and she had a daughter who was two years older than me named Laura Beckman. And this interesting thing happened with Laura when she was a junior in high school, which is that she tried out for the volleyball team. At the end of the tryouts, the coach came to her and said, you know, Laura, we have a tough case. You're right on the borderline of being varsity. So we're going to give you a choice. You can choose to be on the varsity team, but you're going to bench the entire season. Or you can choose to go on the JV team, and you can start every game. And most people, when they're faced with that choice, choose to be on the JV team and start, because everyone wants to play more games. And interestingly, Laura picked the counterintuitive choice. And she said, you know what? I'm going to go and play on the varsity team. And you know, I remember everyone kind of scratching their heads at that. But what was interesting is a year later, when everyone came back to try out for senior year, Laura made varsity with flying colors and actually ended up being a starter her senior year. And all the people who started on JV their, their junior year ended up benching on varsity their senior year, which I think you guys can all relate that you know, benching your senior year of high school is a lot worse than benching your junior year. And when I remember talking to Laura afterwards, I said, you know, well, what made you make that choice? And she just said, I just knew that if I got to play with the better players, that it would make me better and that I would ultimately be able to grow and learn a lot. And I think the same thing happens on an intellectual level as well. And I just feel really lucky to be at Google where there's a ton of smart people to learn from because I think it makes, they challenge you to think 
and work on a different level than you really thought possible. And the types of perspectives and interesting intellectual arguments they make really give you a whole new way of thinking about things. And it also has a lot of other nice properties, like I referenced earlier, which is that you can give them a lot of empowerment and you don't have to have a lot of management or bureaucracy in the organization. The next thought is a license to pursue dreams. And this, I think, actually has to do with probably a lot of you have heard about Google's 20% time. How many people here have this concept that you get to spend one day a week working on whatever you want to work on? And it's interesting because it almost never plays out like that, <laughs> right? What, do you'd see hap what we see happen is, you know, it's not like people really religiously say, okay, every Friday I'm working on exactly what I want to work on. Sometimes people do that, but more often, you know, they'll work on their core project for a few months, and then they'll take some time off of that and work on their 20% their project for a few weeks. Or they'll work on it on the weekends, or they'll work on it on the evenings. But it's not nearly as principled as 20% time. Um, but there's a couple of interesting observations I've seen come out of this. One is that people will say, I've often asked me, well, 20% time, doesn't that just mean you're giving away 20% of your productivity? Because these guys are going to go and work on whatever they want to work on. And in response to that argument, I went and mapped the last six months of 2005, all of the Google product launches and all of our feature launches, and tried to determine which ones came from 20% time and which ones were, you know, came, came through the normal process. And the answer was 50%. So 50% of what Google launched in the second half of 2005 actually got built out of 20% time. It turns out when you take really smart people, give them really good tools, they build really beautiful, amazing things that are really exciting. And they do it with a lot of passion and momentum in such a way that you, know, you actually see two and a half times the output of what you would expect given the time. So I think that's a really strong statement. But when I thought about 20% time, the key isn't that it's 20% or one day a week. It's that I think that our, our engineers and our, and, the, and our product developers you see that and they realize that this is a company that really trusts them, that really wants them to be creative and really wants them to explore whatever it is that they want to explore. And it's that license to do whatever they want that really ultimately fuels a huge amount of creativity and a huge amount of innovation. Then there's my next one, which is innovation, not instant perfection. So I think it's been interesting to watch as Google scaled up the expectations of our users and of the public of our products. Because, you know, now when we launch something, you know, people immediately say, well, you know, it's so rough, it's not very good, <laughs> right? Like, you know, and it turns out when we were small, we launched really rough things that weren't very good all the time. But the key is iteration. When you launch something, can you learn enough about the mistakes that you made and learn enough from your users that you ultimately iterate really quickly? I call this my Max and Madonna theory. When you look at like Apple, Madonna, they were cool in 1983. They're still cool today, 2006, 23 years later. And that's really amazing to look at. People think of them as very innovative and very inventive. How do they do it? And the answer is they don't do it by being perfect every single time. They do, you know, there's lots of missteps along the way. Apple had the Newton, Madonna had the sex book. There's been all kinds of controversies and mistakes made. <laughs> okay. But the answer is, you know, when you make a mistake, you just iterate your way out of it or you reinvent yourself. And I think that's ultimately the charge that, that we have is to launch these innovations and then make them better. And there's a lot of, of instances where we've launched, you know, laughable products. Uh, when we uh, did Google News and we, we made laughable mistakes, when we did Google News, I remember we really wanted to launch in the first part of the week. It's something we learned early on that it's better to launch a product in the, you know, sometime between Monday and Wednesday than it is later in the week. And we sort of missed, we realized we weren't going to launch by Wednesday. So we decided we'd take another four days to make the product better. So we had this meeting on Wednesday and we said, okay, well, we've got a couple of extra days. Should we implement a new feature? And there were six people on the team and we got into a big argument. If we hadn't more time to launch this extra feature, should we put in the feature sort by date? Or should we have search by location? Would people want to see the freshest news? Or would they want to see news that was relevant to their location? And in terms of this, might be obvious to some of you. It's certainly obvious to the journalists which ones are going to be, is going to be more useful. But being computer scientists, we didn't really know. And because there were six of us, we ended up in a dead heat. Three people said we should do sort by date. Three people said we should do search by location. The team got locked in an hour-long argument about which one was more important. And in the end, I had to sort of step up and say, OK, guys, we don't know which one is more important. 
And we're not going to end up doing either now because we can't make up our minds. So let's just spend four days polishing the thing up, and then we'll see what the users say. So we launched on Monday morning, and when we looked at the email that had come in by about 5 p.m., we had gotten about 305 messages. And 300 of them asked for sort by date. <laughs> <laughs> and three of them asked for search by location, and two of them could have been loosely defined to maybe be asking for search by location. But the users answered this question 100 to 1 really easily for us. Um, and it turned out it was really the right thing to do, to just get the product out there and then have the users tell us where it was most important for us to spend our time. And you know, we've done other things like Google Video, I think, is really funny. You know, we launched Google Video. And the funniest thing about it is we called it Google Video, but you couldn't actually watch video. <laughs> so, <laughs> so people found this very counterintuitive. It turns out that users really do want to watch video. That was the first feature they asked for. <laughs> and we, uh, <laughs> that one isn't as much of a shocker to me. <laughs> and you know, so one of our first iterations was actually getting the rights to play video and having a really great player experience in the browser so people could watch the video as opposed to just searching the closed captions. But a lot of times, you know, people say, oh, look at Google, and there's all these innovative things. And they remember the high points. And they, you know, they'll ask me sometimes, like, have you ever made mistakes? And the answer is we make mistakes every time, every day, thousands of things wrong with Google and its products that we know we could fix. Um, but if you launch things and iterate it really quickly, people forget about those mistakes. And they have a lot of respect for how quickly you build the product up and make it better. Data is apolitical. Uh, I think that. I call this, you know, there's a very interesting feeling around, around uh, Google. People will come in, like my friends would come in in you know, 2000, and they would say, wow, it's like Stanford with stock options. Because um, <laughs> like, it has a very academic feel. In fact, I had an issue where I would hire people in from other companies, and they were used to giving classic executive presentations, where you would get up and say, you know, you would, if you say you had done a user study, you'd say, the three high points are, people are having a hard time doing this, this part of it is easy and working well, and you know, this is a point for future development. And there'd be no data, no numbers at all in this type of executive summary. And you know, the first thing I would do is I would have to sit down and say, that's never going to fly. There's just no way that that's going to make it through an executive presentation at Google. <laughs> because you know, Eric, Larry, Sergey, all the executives want to drill down, and they want to hear about the numbers. You can't walk in and, and say to Larry or Sergey, most people are having a hard time finding this, or ha most people are having a hard time working this feature. Because their immediate question is, how many people did you test? How many people had problems? How was the task you know, set up? They really want to drill down into the data. But the interesting, pro the, the interesting property this has is that it makes Google, even as large as we've gotten, I think that the internal politics inside of Google have remained minimal compared to other corporations of its size. Because we rely so much on the data, and we do so much measurement that you don't have to worry, will your idea get picked because you're the favorite? Or will someone else's good idea get picked because they're the favorite? Or because they have a better relationship with the person who's the decision maker? The decisions get made based on data. And that really frees people from a lot of those types of concerns. Right? You know, when I do user interface design, you know, a designer will come to me and say, well, there's this green on the interface, and there's that green on the interface. Or we could lay it out this way or that way. And we don't need to make an arbitrary decision because we'll just run both of them on the site in what we call split A-B testing, where we give some users one experience, some users the other experience, watch the data and the metrics that come out of that, and it will be able to scientifically and mathematically prove which one users seem to actually be responding to better. So we're blessed because we have a really large user base and we can do things like that. But I think it also has a really nice property in that the decisions and the way people relate to each other is a lot less political. My next theorem is that creativity loves constraint. Um, and this sounds really counterintuitive, because when you think about creativity, you think about you know, having a lot of freedom to do whatever you want. And I think that you know, from my perspective, what I see is that a lot of times when you constrain your thoughts, that's when you ultimately see a lot of innovation happen. I have a good friend who's a clockmaker in London. He did the Millennium Clock, among other things. And when I asked him, why, do you want to, why are you a clockmaker? Why not just be a sculptor when you can sculpt whatever you want? His answer was that when he was in art class in, you know, as, a, as a student, he preferred to start on paper that it had a mark on it already. He just liked that constraint. Because he said, you know, I feel like if there's a mark on a piece of paper, 
I can take that mark and in my imagination I can figure out what to turn it into. But a blank piece of paper is almost just too intimidating. He said, so like my sculpture is the same. If I know I'm building a clock, it's like a mark on a piece of paper. It's something that I'm constrained by, but it ultimately makes me want to think my way out of that box and do something really interesting. And I think we see the same thing happen inside of product development and inside of innovation. A lot of times it's when you say, okay, Google Desktop search, we want it to run on 90% of computers. So you know, it can't have a memory footprint larger than 8 megs, and it can't take more than this amount of disk. And what can we do with that? How, how will the files need to be stored? You know, what kind of data will we be able to search? How, what features can we roll out? That's when you really see a lot of really interesting innovation happen is when you actually pen in the constraints. Users, not money. Uh, it's interesting. You know, people, you know, now I think people understand how Google makes money. In the early days, people would say, you know, the first question at any talk like this would be from the audience would be, how does Google make money? And you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, aren't you worried as you roll out new products, you know, will there be a business model there and, you know, with all this innovation? And to be honest, we don't really worry about that. We worry a lot about whether or not we have users, but we don't worry a lot about the business model in the beginning because it turns out, especially on the web and especially with consumer products, money follows consumers. The consumers may choose to subscribe to things themselves. Advertisers also follow consumers, so if you manage to amass a huge amount of users and you're doing something that they use every single day, you'll find a way to monetize it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is sort of the if you build it, they will come <laughs> strategy. Or, you know, Larry always used to like to say that there's no such thing as success failure on the web. If you're in a truly virtual business, how many people have seen this commercial where they show someone launching an e-business? And then they show like the number of orders ratcheting up and saying like when you have a physical problem like FedEx is your answer or something like that. Have people seen this? Now, that's an example of a success failure. It's a success, a success failure that breeds virtual and physical together. But in a virtual business, it's very hard to have a success failure because if you're really successful and you get used a lot, there's usually a very easy and obvious way to figure out how to, how to, how to monetize it. And then my final and ninth, ninth year before I open up for questions is don't kill projects, morph them. And this is, I think, a really interesting and antithetical idea that, that came from Eric. So once we were analyzing which projects and which products on our site work really well and which ones you know, seem to be faltering, and Eric said to me, well, well what are you going to do about some of these projects that don't seem to be showing the growth trends? that they, they should be showing. And I said, well, I'm not sure. You know, maybe we should try and rejuvenate them. Maybe we should just cancel them. Maybe we should you know, sort of pull them back into the shop and, and let them work for a while but not have them be quite so prominent until, until they, they've gotten fixed. And he said, don't kill projects, morph them. He's like, in an environment like Google where you have really smart people, if an idea has actually managed to make it out the door, meaning there's a real product there and there's a lot of people working on it, usually there's some kernel of truth in it. Mm -hmm there is something interesting and innovative in that space. And it may be that the way we packaged it or the way we implemented it isn't quite right, but it's important to recognize that that really smart, talented person got interested and excited about this for a reason. And there's probably something that you can do to ultimately make it successful. And I think it's really interesting to think about you know, not walking away from ideas, but instead trying to figure out how to repackage them and how to rejuvenate them. So those are my nine theorems of innovation. I can expound on a lot of them more if you'd like. But I thought with that I would open up for questions. And, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you talk about some of the personal characteristics that made you successful? Uh, so the question was, uh, what personal characteristics have made me successful? Um, I think that's a, a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a hard question. I think. It's, it's funny. Well, one is that I like, I like to work. It was funny. Last, last week, I, I gave a talk over at Google, and my father came and stood in the back. And it was the first time that he's ever heard, heard me give a talk. And some of the people who work for me found him in the back. I said, you know, just stand in the back, hang, you know, hang low. And uh, they found him, and they said, you know, well, have you ever seen Marissa talk before? And he said, they said, no. He said, no. And they said, well, why not? And he said, I'm Marissa's dad. I like to work, <laughs> and, my, and my associates found that hilarious, right, because they know I'm sort of a workaholic. So I definitely like to work hard, and I think that's a big part of it. Um, but I think the other two things that I would point out come from the decision criteria that I used to 
uh, to go to Google. And one is that I like to surround myself with really smart people. When I sat down over spring break that spring, because, you know, it was the height of the bubble. Everyone coming out of Stanford CS had, like, 15 offers. I did it as well, and I needed criteria to help me sift through them. And I thought, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the best decisions I've ever made, and I'm going to try and figure out what they have in common, and especially, like, decisions that are really different from each other. So I thought about coming to Stanford, switching my major to symbolic systems, working in Switzerland. And the things that they had in common were, one, I always surrounded myself with really smart people using the Laura Beckman theory. I think that that's somewhere where you can learn and, and grow. And Craig Silverstein at Google, uh, Larry and Sergey are impressive in a lot of ways, but Craig Silverstein, who was their first employee, was just, it was and still is one of the top five smartest people I've ever met in person in my life. And when I interviewed with him, I thought, oh, my God, I just want to go to Google and, like, learn from this guy. So for the first two years I was there, I was, like, Craig's little apprentice on the web server. <laughs> I learned a huge amount from him. So, one, I like to work with really smart people. And, two, I like to do things that I'm a little not ready to do, like moving to Switzerland and trying to live and work there for the summer, even though I didn't speak German. <laughs> right? Because I think that you have these moments when you can be, really overwhelmed because I remember you know going to Switzerland signing 60 pages of documents in German I couldn't read <laughs> for my German only speaking landlady and then getting sent to the grocery store and being verbally assaulted because the process of buying produce in Germany is completely different than the process of, of, of buying in Switzerland is completely different than the process of buying produce here it turns out you're responsible for printing out a sticker and all kinds of things <laughs> and I was like what am I doing here if I can't even buy grapes like I'm gonna be completely over my head <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I think that, you know, it's in those moments when you do something you're not ready to do that you learn a whole new skill set, and it's those risks that ultimately, you know, cause you to find your boundaries and, and get good at things that you weren't good at before. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about don't kill projects morph them. Do you find that true with your personal projects also, or is that only projects that have been through the filtering process of other people? Personal projects? Yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, you can't just say, okay, you know, every idea I've ever had is great. Because like, some ideas that we all have are just, you know, twaddle, and they should just be discarded as quickly as they came into your head. But I think the idea here is once something's taken on the full life of a project, right, and there's, you know, engineers working on it, there's PMs working on it, there's UI designers working on it, there's a reason it built up that much momentum and that much interest, and there's a reason why so many smart people have spent so much of their time, energy, and passion working on this. So don't just walk away from it because it's faltering. Have respect for the fact that, there's something interesting there. So I agree, like, you know, you can't just say every idea is a good idea, but to the point where it's, once it's got filtered and it's gotten, you know, a life and legs of its own, it makes sense to really examine that before, before killing it. Yeah. It seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the culture of Google and what you're perpetuating seems to me that it's very reminiscent to the bubble. Group. It, does, is that in the back of the mind of Google or are you afraid of? Sure. So the question was, is the culture that Google uh, perpetuates one that resembles those of the bubble years? And I think the answer is in some ways yes. Like people who walk into Google say, wow, it looks like the bubble never burst here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's one key difference, which is that Google makes money. And I know, you know, like, uh, so, right, like, I think that there's, you know, that's a key thing that people forget about, because I know you guys were all really young when the bubble happened, and maybe you didn't experience this, but there were a lot of weird things, like, you know, selling pet food on the Internet at, you know, wholesale oil prices. But it turns out, like, pet food is just really heavy, and it really shouldn't be shipped, and that doesn't make a lot of economical sense. You really should buy it at the grocery store right down the street. Um, you know, there's things like that that just didn't make sense as business models. And I think that we've been really committed to having a business model that works um, from the very beginning. You know, Sergey used to joke that, you know, he needed dates in 2000, and he had to do something to differentiate himself from every other losing money dot com, you know, president. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we were very focused on becoming profitable from a very early time, which was not true of most of the, the companies in the bubble. And I think, you know, I think about the bubble bursting, I've often compared it to a forest fire, which is, you know, forest fires are, in fact, healthy, right? They clean out a lot of the brush and the overgrowth and, and all that. And the, and the trees that ultimately survive the forest fire and, and repopulate are, in fact, healthier because there was something that was healthier about them. And I think that that's ultimately what you see at Google. I think a lot of the good things that happen in all the small companies and startups of the bubble persist, but there are a few key differences that caused it to actually survive the forest fire. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have found a very major problem with Google AdWords. Could you be 
listening to the problem. I think I've got a solution to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I should clarify my role at the company first. So <laughs> I probably should have done this from the beginning. But uh, uh, so my role is I, I work on the consumer search products. So that's web search, images, groups, news, local, and our downloadable search clients like the toolbar, desktop, Google Pack. Uh, and so on and so forth. So while well, I have some visibility into AdWords, I can certainly get you to the right people inside of the organization. The features and, and solutions that would, would manifest themselves in AdWords aren't necessarily in, in my domain. This is quite a display to give you but One question I have, there was on the news today that AT&T was sharing their customers' information with the federal government. Is Google doing the same thing? Like Say, if somebody is looking for an Islamic website, are you sharing it with the federal government? So the question is, how much information does Google share with the federal government or even third parties? Uh, and the answer is we have a really firm privacy policy in place where we don't share any of your information that you've shared with Google with a third party without your express consent. We have to comply with, le with legal orders, so we, we do occasionally get small orders that will cause us to give some information to the federal government, but there was a fairly uh, visible case that happened in January. You may have read something about it, like Google, it was written up a lot as like Google versus the DOJ. DOJ is Department of Justice. Because the DOJ came to us and they asked to see all of our logs for an entire month and see all search traffic, and particularly search traffic on pornographic queries and, and other things. And we looked at, you know, I, I have to say that, you know, I think that one thing that's true about Google is that we try and innovate all over the company. And we try and make sure that people are, you know, really engaged and aren't asleep at the wheel. And I'm really proud of our legal team in, the, in that case because what happened was they issued that order to all of the major search engines. And for most people, you know, for the other search engines, it was just, course of the day, to, and they just turned over all the data. And our lawyers looked at it and said, wait, we've never seen a request of this magnitude before. We think this far, in, far you know, greatly invades our users' privacy, and we contested it. And we ultimately you know, went to court, and the judge said that we didn't have to comply with that particular order, and ultimately uh, only approved a much more scaled back limited order. And I think that I think that's a testimony to Google's commitment to our users and to privacy. Um, because we will ultimately contest things that we think are, are overreaching. Yeah. How much do you uh, future forecast? Future forecasting? Uh, well, we have. For example, I'm I've sure. seen uh, lots of advertisements from Google, something like EPEC or Google Zone that was forecasted, and I think uh, lots of things up to 2014. And sure, sure. And so, mm -hmm. I want to know uh, how much do you forecast? How do you forecast things, and uh, how do you follow them? And uh, a couple of thoughts here. So we do have a little, so the first question, the question is how much do we use futures forecasting? Um, and I think there's a couple of different answers here. We have a tool internal to Google where we're trying to understand how futures may actually, uh, like how future markets may actually help us predict things. So when we have, say, a company goal for the quarter, we'll have people, they can bid on the futures to try and, and estimate whether or not we're going to meet that goal. And that's actually been very interesting because people can spot projects and goals that they have low confidence in, and we get an actually insight into that, into that earlier. But that said, I think that there's also a lot to be said for having a great amount of expertise in an area and a great amount of insight. And we've tried at Google to assemble you know, some, of, some of the world's best experts in search, in running data centers, in transferring around a lot of data, running large uh, computation infrastructures. And I think as a result, you know, a lot of that expertise also helps us predict the future in some ways better than a futures market would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talked about uh, users uh, during your, um, <coughs> in your slide, in one of your slides, and that uh, user feedback is probably the best thing that you can uh, get for an iterative procedure to improve your product or software. Uh, Google is right now in a, in a position where it can use this philosophy to get feedback from users, telling them, okay, I don't want this feature or I want this feature. But how does a startup company or let's say an individual who's just starting off and he doesn't have users looking at his product or software uh, giving him feedback. So how, how does he get to a point where he has somebody who's at least willing to take a look and maybe give creative, positive feedback, whatever? 
Sure, I think there's a couple of, so the question was, how does, you know, Google has a lot of usage, so as a result we can rely a lot on metrics and data. But when you're starting out in a startup, you don't necessarily have that luxury. So how do you get data in that situation? Um, and I've been at Google now for about seven years, since almost the beginning. And you know, when I first started out, we didn't have access to a lot of, a lot of great data. So I ended up using a lot of existing research. It turns out there is a lot of, you know, reasonably applicable and analogous uh, cognitive psychology research you can apply to most things, especially user experience, right? So, you know, when I had to make a decision about should the Google results pages be serif or sans serif, I didn't have enough users for me to be able to, to do the split A-B testing and mathematically figure that out. So I ended up just reading a lot of research and ultimately finding out that serif fonts are more readable and sans serif fonts are more legible. <laughs> like, which is, you know, it makes the conclusion of what you should do just obvious, right? <laughs> like, but it turns out it actually is really obvious after you read that because when they say that something's more readable, uh, what happens with the serifs is they create a horizontal rule across the page that guides the eye. So serif fonts are much better when you're reading long pieces of text. Sans serif fonts are more legible, which means that because the serifs, those little flags on the ends, are removed, your eye can spot read a character much better. It can recognize, oh, this is a lowercase h. Uh, much more quickly, and so as a result, it's much better for spot reading. So in act an activity like search, it turns out you want to facilitate spot reading to a much greater degree than, than reading long prose, so we ultimately switched it. But that's basically the type of work that we did. So, you know, we would read a lot from those types of studies. It turns out you can also do a lot with budget uh, usability. Uh, you know, the first usability test that we did here would be me, you know, sending to uh, su.market and saying, you know, $20 free t-shirts and pizza show up at gates at noon on, on Saturday and, uh, and just you know, getting users in, putting products in front of them and seeing what they all do because you know, there's a huge amount that you can get done by just having a user sit in front of a computer for an hour and see how they, how they interact with your product. In the back, yeah? What does Google look like in five years? So the question is, what does Google look like in five years? Um, and I think that, you know, if I knew that, I probably wouldn't still be there, right? If you know the future, it becomes uninteresting to still be a part of it and try and invent it. Um, so I don't know exactly what it looks like. I do know there's a few things that I think should ultimately be different. Um, one is that I think that the result pages are going to have to become much more heterogeneous and much more interactive. Right? I've been at Google for seven years. I've been responsible for the look and feel of the site for most of it. And my friends and family are starting to give me a hard time. And they say, so you're responsible for Google's look and feel? I say, yes. And they say, but it looks the same. <laughs> like, like, what do you do all day? <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I think I, we should probably change things up a bit. Um, so I think that... You know, when you put in a query into Google, 10 URLs is not always the best answer, right? If somebody asks you, you know, how to cut up a chicken or how to change a bicycle tire, a video is a much better answer than a URL. Somebody right, types into Google, you know, what does Britney Spears look like? A picture is a much better answer than a URL. And I think we're going to have to do a much better job flushing up a lot of different modes and mediums into the results and crafting more what we refer to as an ideal result set. I also think that as in, you know, in five years, you know, I, five years is a tough, tough time frame. So I think it's easier to look 20 years out because there's some trends that are obviously underway in that time frame. And six months out is easy because we're already doing the things that will probably launch in that time frame. But, you know, people always tend to sort of, you know, overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term, right? I remember being five and seeing the Jetsons and thought, this is great. By the time I'm 30, they'll be flying cars. <laughs> you know, and now I'm 30 and there's like not even a prototype. You, it isn't a death trap. Um, but there's like all kinds of other interesting things that have happened, like the internet. Um, so I think that uh, other things that will happen will be along the um, the, uh, the, uh, the area of mediums and how results get delivered. So, for example, I think the wireless will come a long way in the next few years, and how we can integrate that into our daily lives is really important. I think that voice technology is going to become, uh, you know, advance a lot, a lot in five years, and that you'll be able to talk to search engines. I think natural language understanding and being able to understand what does Britney Spears look like on a semantic level as opposed to just a keyword level will potentially be under, underway in that time. And I think that's pretty interesting. And also just, you know, computers showing up in, in strange but useful places. Um, you know, BMW, as of September, which will have a computer on board every single one of their cars. 
from the little one series that's only sold in Europe, you know, all of the way up through the through the high end. I mean, you think about you know, if you had a computer with wireless in your car at any given time, and it you know could respond to voice and other simple commands. There's a lot of interesting things you could do, including a lot with search. If you were just driving down the road and said, you know, I, I need the nearest fast food restaurant, or I need the nearest place I can get a deli sandwich, I think there's a lot of interesting things that could happen. Yeah. Is there a company out there that Google fears? And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, um, employee motivation. Uh, any thoughts on on that? Because uh, Google basically came out of the shoot as a Wall Street darling. And I've just done a little bit of financial research and found that it's very difficult to stay on top for even a decade, even 10 years. Yeah. So how do you motivate employees and that are this financially wealthy that early? Uh, so I'll start with the, the first question was, um, what startups does Google fear? Um, and I have to say that I don't think we really fear startups because you know, we have a very healthy philosophy around the rising tide floats all boats. We think that additional interest, creativity, innovation, competition in the space ultimately benefits the end user and forces everyone in that area to make their products better. And I think that's something really healthy and positive that happens. I will say that I think there's a phenomenon industry-wide that is not well understood, and that's social networking. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, we have our own product, Orkut, which is incredibly popular in Brazil and almost nowhere else, Brazil and Iran. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's, you know, it's, good to, it's good to be a market leader, at least in some places. <laughs> and uh, you know, when you look at some of the numbers that are coming out of MySpace and Facebook, you know, my observation was you know, people use search a lot. You know, we like to say that search is the number two most used application on the web, uh, right behind email. Um, but you know, on a good day, you know, on a good average day, users do seven to 10 searches. And when we start looking at the usage on social networking sites like Orkut or like the types of numbers that you're seeing uh, released on, on MySpace, these users log on and they do on average 100 page views a day. Right, that's the closest thing to user crack I've ever seen. They like get on these sites and they just can't stop, right? And they're like, and you know, because I mean, that's a, the per, per registered user, not even per active user. So that means, like, you know, if there's like, you know, if there's 20 million people that are, are, are registered users, probably only like 15 million of them log in on a certain day, and they're still hitting two billion page views per day. Which means that's more than 100 page views per day per person. Um, that's just phenomenal, and it's, I don't think it's well understood in the in in the industry what's happening there and how will it ultimately manifest itself. Because uh, I don't think it's just something. You know, some people say, well, you know, is it just for teenagers or just for people in their 20s? Is it just about dating or facilitating academia? You know, like study groups and things like that. And I think that it's ultimately going to have a lot of practical applications around photo hosting, around instant messaging. Why would you type in your buddy list two different places rather than one? I think there's a lot of really interesting integrations that will happen there. It's clear it's a really, really powerful medium. Uh, and the second question was around how w will we continue to motivate our employees given some of the success and wealth around, around Google. And I think, you know, it's interesting. It has to do with the, the motivations of the people that we've hired. Um, and I think it's become very self-sustaining at this point because in the very early days of Google, I remember I think it was July of 1999, uh, we were in a terrible state as a company. I mean, it was like really fun, but we were in a terrible state. Like just, we, we would crawl the web, and our crawling the web consisted of this guy named Harry who had the title Spider-Man, because he ran the crawler, the spider that went around the web. Mm -hmm. um, and he, Harry would run 500 commands at the Linux command line prompt. <laughs> and nothing was checkpointed, which meant if he made a mistake on line 253, we had to start over. <laughs> And uh, Harry would run this process, and it would take him three to five days to, to crawl the web. And you know, the rest of us would be coding on our projects, and we would stay in the office late just to motivate Harry and keep him well caffeinated. <laughs> like, go, Harry, go. Like, you're feeling OK? You're getting ready to type in the next command? Um, <laughs> like, and there was one night when we were all sitting around. Harry was in his office, and we were all sitting in this big circle, because everyone sort of petered out you know, coding at around 3 AM. And, we were having one of those conversations that you see happen a lot here in dorms, especially fall quarter, when new groups of people are forming. You know, sort of all the freshmen sit around and they're all swapping stories from their history or what they hope to get, pat, get out of Stanford, or what they're hoping to do. And we had one of these conversations where everyone was like, well, what could Google do? You know, what could we try and achieve in the future? And interestingly, I remember in that conversation, we came up with the idea of Google Book Search. Let's scan all the libraries and get all the data online. We you know, waited to actually pursue that for, for five additional years, but we had a lot of ideas. And it was this really magical conversation. And at some point, 
you know, have all these like giant exercise balls all over Google, and that's what people sit on during these kinds of discussions. And <laughs> like somebody jumped off of their ball into the center of the circle and said, I just want everyone to stop. And remember this moment, because from whatever happens from this moment on, it'll never be as good as it is right now. And we all just sort of stopped and like took in the moment and then <laughs> went back to taking care of Harry. But, <laughs> but what, was, what I think is really remarkable about it is that same conversation about what could Google do, what, how could we advance search, how could we advance the world, how could we impact it, happens every night around the pool table at Google. In fact, I wish I had an MP3 recording of that first conversation. And if I recorded the same conversation tonight and played them for you, because you couldn't recognize the voices, I don't think you'd actually be able to tell the difference. Because the type of people that come to Google now are really interested in changing the world and making a meaningful, positive impact on people's lives and the entrepreneurial spirit. And you know, companies go through different cultural changes, but I remember around 1,200 employees, I would ask new people, you know, you run into engineers who are new in the, in the cafeteria, and I'd be like, well, why, why did you come to Google? Why, are you in, why were you interested in being here? And I started hearing this common answer, like, I came here to participate in the culture. I came here to participate in the innovation. And you know, it becomes very self-fulfilling at that point, because if people are coming to participate in the culture and they're coming to participate in the innovation, the last thing they want to do is screw it up. Right? So when they come, they're, you know, they, they really are motivated for the right reasons, and they're very delicate around what it is that achieves that balance. Yeah. The question with a lot of the products start out as beta, they're labeled beta, and I remember mm -hmm. there was some commentary going on for some of them, like how long is this going to be beta, how long is this going to be beta, and so forth. I was just wondering, what is your definition of beta with your iterative approach? Does anything ever become final? And kind of a related question is, do you have schedules at Google? Or? Sure, sure. So the, the question is around our use of the beta label, and do we have schedules at Google? Um, so the beta label is interesting, and I have to say, you know, as of, as of last week, I felt like, you know, we really, you know, I provided some real executive value add here, which is, you know, we would launch things in beta. Sometimes we would launch them on the main site in beta. Sometimes we would launch them on Google Labs in beta. And the truth is, sometimes they would come out really fully baked, and they'd be like Google News or Google Video and be pretty fully baked at some point with a beta label on them. And sometimes they would be really early stage. So we've tried to create a hierarchy of these products now and make it clear that, Google Labs, not, nothing, there's no betas on Google Labs anymore. So you'll see we kind of rebranded the site last week. So if you're on Google Labs, uh, you have a special logo. It looks like the little owl turns into a beaker and, and it says Labs there. And basically, Labs is, is Google's version of alphas. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're not going to have any more of this confusion of, you know, it's a Labs beta versus a real beta versus a full product. So you're either Labs, which is alphas, you're betas, which means, you know, we're still actively, we usually something's in beta because there's, an active user need that we feel we need to fulfill before we can really call the product complete. Uh, and then, you know, once we, we roll the final version, it doesn't even mean that we stop working on it, just that we, we believe that it represents a, at least a comprehensive feature complete experience for the user. So we've been a little bit abusive of that tag over time. We're trying to clean up, uh, clean up that uh, practice now, but I still think that there, there are some valid reasons for why things are beta. And beta on the web is a little bit different than beta on shipping software. Right, which means you know the beauty of running a service is that you can change it, you know, almost almost every day. And I'm sorry, there was a follow-on part of that question. Oh, the schedules piece. Um, mm -hmm. So, does Google have schedules? And I think the answer is obviously yes. Uh, sometimes they're really dramatically off. Like I remember when I launched Google News, I thought it was going to take four months, and it took nine. And I have a very fancy certificate from our VP of Engineering naming me the ultimate mistress of underestimation <laughs> um, because I was like, you know, off by like a factor of three or something on, on, my, on my product launch schedule. Uh, so we do have schedules and we, we have a lot of, we run the uh, process quarterly called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. And so this, where we state our objectives as a company of what we want to do and the key results are incredibly measurable goals. Did this product launch by this date? Did we hit this number of advertisers? You know, did we you know, achieve this level of user happiness? Uh, and so on and so forth. And they're very, and they're very, very, very quantitative. And so you know, on that level, we do have a lot of schedules and a lot of, of goals and internal pressure to, to make things better and, and achieve momentum. So Thank you. <laughs>
like to make a quick announcement. Um, we have a sushi mixer afterwards, and Marissa will be here for about 15 minutes or so. Um, but uh, once again, um, let's get a round of applause for Marissa Mayer for coming to speak with us today. Thank you. Thank you. This is great.